Hello, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this press conference. Antonio Sullivan, UK Prepare, who the lean leaders see this COVID fire. Keeping this event as COVID secure as possible, there are hand sanitizers everywhere, and set rules to make it safe to The event will be after myself, Lorna Hopkins, our moderator for today, the last members of the panel, so we will A sincere thanks to Lorna for inviting me to be a long distance thank you to our listening panel, who is working on our event. Of course, thank you to over 50 witnesses. Run down of the NHS and the intense inequality in this country is vital in tackling this epidemic. Our inquiry heard the sadness, the questions, and the insights. We heard the pride of NHS care and other frontline workers. We heard about their pain and their exhaustion and their moral anguish. <coughs> listened to vital expert testimony on the failings in public health. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. On the failings in public health, failings on workplace safety, on the impact of inequalities, and on the running down of the NHS. The level of government cronyism and the resultant profiteering has been blatant and in plain sight. Our overall conclusion that there has been misconduct in public office has to be addressed. If we, ignore, <coughs> if we ignore this, the country cannot learn the lessons from today to face the challenges of tomorrow. If the NHS care and support services and inequalities are not addressed, the future for the population is bleak. Keeper NHS public believes that these findings are an important contribution to what must change and what must change now. And now I want to introduce Lorna, who's taking over for the, for the morning. Lorna was counsel to our People's Code of Inquiry. Lorna is a barrister and co-founder of Hackett and Dabbs LLP. She specializes in human rights and public law. She is committed to protecting the most vulnerable within society and has a strong track record in judicial review proceedings. She trains other barristers other barristers in advocacy and is a renowned public speaker on social justice and prisoners' rights. Thank you, Lorna. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Tony. Um, it is an honour and a privilege to be here this morning. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel to you and uh, then we're going to hear some short statements from each of them. So first, uh, it is my honour and privilege to introduce uh, the chair of the People's COVID Inquiry, Michael Mansfield. Michael Mansfield is an internationally renowned human rights lawyer. He's represented individuals, families and groups in some of the most controversial legal cases the UK has ever seen. The Stephen Lawrence Inquiry, the Bloody Sunday Inquiry, the Hillsborough Disaster, John Charles de Menezes, the Marchioness Inquiry, and shoot to kill in Northern Ireland. He's chaired international people's tribunals on the Middle East, the Lewisham People's Commission on Lewisham Hospital and the Northwest London NHS Hospital Inquiry. Lewisham, Charing Cross and Ealing Hospitals all saved from closure. He's currently heavily involved in the Grenfell Inquiry. 
We then have Professor Nina Modi, who is the Professor of Neonatal Medicine, Imperial College London, and President of the British Medical Association, a leading researcher and fellow and member of Council of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences. Nina has worked to improve children's health throughout her career. She is the immediate past president of the UK Medical Women's Federation and past president of the UK Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Dr. Taluna Oni, another member, um, is also an urban epidemiologist and public health physician at the Medical Research Council Epidemiology Unit, University of Cambridge, and fellow of Wolfson College, Cambridge, and the African Academy of Sciences. Taluna was born in Lagos, studied in London, and worked in South Africa for over 10 years. Her research, focused on ways to improve health in cities, has been profiled in the Lancet Journal. She sits on the educational board of the Lancet Planetary Health, Cities and Health, and Global Public Health Journals, serves as a commissioner on the Global Commission for Post-Pandemic Policy, and is a member of Independent SAGE. And as Tony said, uh, Tallulah can't be here today, but she was a vital part of this inquiry. Dr. Jackie Davis is an NHS consultant radiologist at Whittington Hospital in North London. Jackie is a founder member of Keep Our NHS Public. She co-authored the books NHS SOS, How the NHS Was Betrayed and How We Can Save It, and NHS For Sale. Jackie is also a member of BMA Council. And finally, we have Dr. Sonia Adesara, who is an NHS doctor and campaigner and member of Keep Our NHS Public. She's active on women's and migrants' rights and one of the NHS frontline during the pandemic. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Michael Mansfield, you see, who chaired this inquiry. Thank you, Lorna, and good morning, everyone. We're very grateful for your attendance, and may I just address those who are online the same as well, welcome to this speaking. And it's mainly going to be about you asking any questions about the work that we've done. It's been a great privilege, as Lorna's just said, to have worked on this inquiry. Just a word about people's inquiries, because sometimes it's, you know, people haven't heard of them or don't know where they come from or what their role is, what kind of creature is it. Well, I've done a lot over the last 15 to 20 years. Normally they occur because citizens, ordinary people say, we are not getting accountability, we're not getting truth, we're not finding out what's really happening. Governments, both international and national, are not fulfilling their obligations. So citizens, and Bertrand Russell was somebody who coined the phrase in a sense, citizens of conscience who want to ensure that the public are made aware of what is going on and what is going wrong, are come together in different ways in different parts of the world to investigate matters that the governments have refused to do. And on this, of course, it's very interesting that the, our government at the moment has dillied and dallied and an arm extent, to begin with, refused to have one. That is a judicial public inquiry, because the problem we've got, as I'll come to in a moment, is we don't have the powers to compel anybody. We don't have the powers to sequester documents. So we have to go on the goodwill. And there's a lot of goodwill, as you will see, in this very fine report, which is excellent, this is only a small part of it, so that it's easier to read, but you will see just how many over 50 witnesses and over four months, the actual live testimony, as well as red testimony. So bringing together all those people and coming to conclusions is fine, but it's only a stepping stone towards what ought to have already happened a judicial inquiry. Now, the bereaved had their press conference yesterday. Very interesting. Did the Prime Minister deign to go? Did the Prime Minister send anybody? Did the Prime Minister send a message to them to say, it's all right, we're going to have a judicial inquiry? Because he said there might be one in the spring. Well, if he's going to have one in the spring, you'd expect the arrangements to have already been put in place. Who's the judge? What's the date? Where are you doing it? Not a word. And we have been pressing on behalf of the people and the bereaved, of course, to find out what exactly is going on. We've written to the cabinet office, you don't get answers or it's being considered or whatever. And the fact is, I, I, we've thrown the gauntlet down from the beginning. Come on, Boris Johnson, where is this public inquiry? Get on with it. It's already too late. Or are you getting a little bit worried about how much more tenure of office you've got? Anyway, that's enough on people's inquiries 
and the object of the exercise, uh, which we say has been achieved magnificently in the work that's contained in, the, in this document and in the bigger one. Right, just another word about the inquiry itself. Uh, a joy to chair because obviously we had professional counsel present, presenting the evidence. We had professional, in a sense, uh, accumulation of evidence and witnesses so that it was a far easier task than it would have been. We conducted it all online. But what's the theme? That's what you want to know about. Well, the theme here is that it's on the cover, in fact, namely misconduct in public office. Now, that has two meanings. General vernacular meaning of a series of, of a pattern or of conduct and behavior that is misconduct. But it also, secondly, specifically, designates an offense. It's a common law offense known as misconduct in public office. Uh, I'll touch on it very briefly. How do we get to that position? Well, we're saying, and I'm using these phrases advisedly, that politicians, so I'm not limiting it to the, and we're not limiting it to the present government, politicians uh, have exhibited gross neglect. And gross neglect of what are, we say, manifestly obvious, risks, risks to life and harm to the general public and their health. Nothing could be more serious than putting that at risk. And we say this government and those ministers that came before who had responsibility for public health have neglected the duty they owe to every one of you and everyone who's listening and watching. Now that's uh, needs to be spelt out a little bit more because it's staged. I think, this is me speaking individually, that one of the most important things for me in this inquiry, the moment that I started to even think about what the government were doing is, wait a minute, wait a minute, pandemic. It's not a new phenomenon. None of, none of you, well, perhaps if you did history, I did a bit. Um, you know, you will remember that pandemics, black death, Shakespeare, plague on your homes, all the rest of it. Yeah, wait a minute, we've had this before, haven't we? Yes, we have. Of course, it's a familiar term and it's a familiar occurrence, but it's much more specific than there's the possibility of a pandemic. In fact, one of the task force um, uh, uh, leaders that left her post earlier this year has said that the greatest threat, she thinks, to uh, the UK, United Kingdom and since the new body that's taken over from Public Health England has got security in the title. The biggest threat to health security in the United Kingdom is another pandemic. So those who bother to think, one has to wonder whether some politicians do, those who bother to think will realize and recognize it's not the only threat, but it's a major threat to public health. And it comes in stages. So stage one, where we are measuring the ob observable and obvious risks, is looking at what was done over the previous decade. Never mind, you know, the history of pandemics. Politicians did begin to think, and they did desktop surveys and exercises, like war games, if you like. And when did they do them? Well, they did them. Actually, not so very long ago, 2016. Alice was one of them, called Alice, the other one, Cygnus. And I've got 30 seconds left, so I'll have to go <laughs> do it as quickly as I can. Okay, so the, the fact is that the, the background is they knew, they practiced, they did nothing. In other words, what they should have been doing before the pandemic ever entered our shores was to have been building up the NHS, building up a global cooperation so that you have a, a, a situation in which new vaccines are being developed before. They knew it possibly could be coronavirus because one of their exercises involved MERS, which had happened in, there was an outbreak of MERS in 2012. So they, they've got the experience, they've got the thoughts and what do they do? Having come to the conclusion that we were not prepared, did they get us prepared? No, they didn't. And the select committee in the House of Commons says, oh, well, we've come to it. It's a sort of group thing, you know, fatalism. 
It's a kind of exceptionalism. This couldn't be more British rubbish. British rubbish. Of course it's not. It's the fact is, that as far as they were concerned, to begin with, we have that phrase that pops up. Herd immunity, would that be what's really going on? Business matters most, could it be? And it, that's stage one. Stage two is what the delay at the beginning when le, a, a lot of people died unnecessarily in the second stage because they delayed for two months doing anything. And then when they did decide to do something, stage three, what do they do? They plow money into private companies. And the pockets, as the National Audit Office pointed out, the pockets of friends and neighbors and relatives, huge sums of money, which should have gone into the NHS. So much did they care for the NHS that really what's been going on has been the dissembly of the NHS. So that's, that's a third stage, a fourth stage in life. The fourth stage is the stage at which we're in now, in which, as somebody put in an interview that I, I did yesterday, he said, this is familiar. I said, yes. We're back to where we're not quite where we were. Interesting, though, anybody coming from abroad, doesn't matter if you've been double vaccine, vaccinated, you've got to go into isolation. Well, quite right. Why didn't you think of all this before? Instead of this knee-jerk on the hoof, policy making and it's a disgrace so we say and i'm ending on this <laughs> i'm sorry to have uh, the the um fact is that if you put all this together i think you come to the definition of the offense which very few have heard of so i'm just gonna i'm gonna read it out and you make the judgment we're saying we passed a threshold here at which this needs to be investigated it is committed where a public, sorry, I do have to wear glasses these days, unfortunately, where a public officer, well, I think we've got loads of those, willfully neglects to perform his duty, well, I think uh, probably we've got well past the threshold on that one. This is the key phrase, to such a degree as to amount to an abuse of the public's trust in the office of the public without reasonable excuse or justification. So the forest is case, no doubt he was right in the company of the back. I'm not sure what happened. But there we are. That's the offence. And so that's what we suggest needs to be investigated. I do apologise for everything. Thank you very much, Mr. Mansfield. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Professor Nina Modi. Thanks very much, Lorna. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for, for being here. I'm going to speak very briefly um, and emphasize a few points about the National Health Service. The NHS was here to protect the public, but in fact, it was the NHS that needed the protection. It needed protection for four principal reasons. First of all, that it had been run down by over a decade of austerity. Uh, bed numbers were, for example, uh, one of, within Britain were amongst the lowest in Europe. We had staffing vacancies of about 100,000. Um, morale was low because of the fact that people were having to work, staff were having to work with these, these incredible vacancies. And of course, this was all being exacerbated as we spoke in the run up to the pandemic because of the repercussions of, of Brexit. Um, and there was also growing pressure because of poor public health. And of course, we all know about the problems of uh, the inadequate of social care, which were piling added pressures onto the NHS. So the NHS was not in a good, good state at all. Um, we also know that the government made major mistakes in relation to its handling of the NHS. First of all, there was the view that if you throw money at a problem, that problem would inevitably be resolved. In other words, there, was no, there appeared to be no comprehension that you need expertise and experience. And my examples here are, of course, the examples of, of PPE and of ventilators. You do not ask the manufacturer of vacuum cleaners to make ventilators. You do not ask people who are engaged in the fashion industry to make very, very skilled PPE. Yet that is what happened. And of course, in parallel with this, eye-watering sums, truly eye-watering sums of money were thrown at the private sector. 
why in heaven's name was, what was this largest, these funds, not used to strengthen the NHS and to strengthen public services? The NHS, for example, the states were funding, uh, they were also under pressure because of the fact that a lot of services had been contracted out of being completely put out to private firms who were working on a very, very strict contractual basis. In other words, there was no flexibility in the system. They, but as I say, they went through eye-watering sums of money, 37 billion pounds for a failed taste of Western choice. Uh, just imagine what that could have done to strengthen public services. And then of course, so instead of engaging in long-term strategic investment in public services, there was then incompetence. There was the building of Nightingale hospitals at huge expense. And of course, had they consulted with the NHS, they would have been told that there were no staff in these hospitals. They ignored their own pandemic preparedness exercises, as Michael has just explained. And of course, they invested at least 37 billion plus 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 in all of these funds that would have been used by the system. And finally, there was hubris and there was cronyism, and I will say no more. So I'm afraid that we have. Waste, competence, ignorance, and failure to invest in. Thank you, Professor Minamodi. Uh, Dr. Jackie Davis. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, other public, um, important public services are also decimated in that uh, decade of austerity before the pandemic. And funding had been stripped from public health. Um, dramatic cuts to school funding had uh, resulted in larger classes, but no larger schoolrooms. And um, social care started the pandemic with 120,000 staff vacancies. So everybody was on the verge of crisis already. As a result of this decade of austerity, there was a worsening of health and social inequalities and increased numbers of vulnerable people. When the pandemic struck, these vulnerable people died in shocking, disproportionately high numbers. And those people included the poor, living in crowded conditions, mostly unable to work from home, <coughs> unable to self-isolate if they got sick because they needed to put food on the table. Elderly in care homes were three times more likely to die than the elderly living in the community. By March 2021, 30% of deaths had taken place in care homes and the disabled whose support structures disintegrated during the pandemic. Those with learning difficulties and mental health needs died at six times the rate of their peers. What else? We heard during this that the government were not engaged. They didn't follow WHO advice. They didn't take the pandemic seriously. They thought they knew best. And we've heard it again today. Guess what, deja vu all over again. Advisors advise and ministers decide. That was on the news this morning. They've learned nothing. They didn't trust people who could have helped. They didn't listen to experts and they didn't talk to those on the front line. As Professor Modi said, they didn't talk to hospital doctors who said, we can't start these Nightingale hospitals and millions were wasted on that. They didn't talk to public health doctors and GPs who could have run test and trace. And as Professor Modi said, billions wasted on the privatized system, which the public accounts committee said, made no appreciable difference. They didn't talk to teaching unions and local authorities who had many suggestions about helping children and protecting their education. And unforgivably, they didn't talk to frontline workers to find out what support they needed. They turned to the private sector and they wasted millions on private beds that were never used. They bypassed NHS laboratories, preferring untended contracts with private ones. They put the economy before the health of the population as evidenced by their flirtation with herd immunity. And as a result of all of this, tens of thousands of people died avoidable deaths. So let's think about this. In the World War II, 67,000 civilians died. We regard that as shocking. So far in the UK, 167,000 people have died from COVID. That's the equivalent of a plane crash every day during the pandemic. Paraphrase Stalin, one death is a tragedy, and 167,000 deaths are in danger of becoming a statistic in this country. We mustn't let that happen. One of our aims is to make sure that those deaths are remembered as individual tragedies. This pandemic was predictable and should have been predictable, predicted. 
the shocking death toll was avoidable as other countries have shown and should have been avoided. The government must accept responsibility for this and it really must never happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Thank you. And uh, now I'm going to hand you over to Sonia, Dr. Sonia Adesala. Stand. Can you hear me okay? So I think sometimes on days like this, it's easy to forget the real human suffering and indignity that lies behind a report like this. I recall a night shift when I was working in the hospital. And I remember one of my first patients was a elderly lady. She had um, bruises on her face, she had a broken bone, and she had been left on the floor for hours. I was in agony because the ambulances that night were just completely inundated. At the start of the shift, we were told there were no free ITU beds left in the hospital. And by midnight, we'd run out of CPAP machines. And I, I can remember viscerally the, the fear I felt that night. But I was also angry. I was angry because this was not March 2020. This was at the start of this year. And it's this government's repeated failure to ignore the advice of their experts. Successive governments for over a decade now, ignoring us frontline workers when we were warning them about, their, about the conditions in the NHS. And this government's repeated failure to listen, failure to learn, repeating the same deadly mistakes, which is why so many of us healthcare workers are, are angry and we feel really let down. And now we are two years on. And again, we see cases arising, we see hospital admissions rising, we see the hospitals are buckling, my local hospital declared a critical incident this week, and again, health workers are screaming for someone to listen, and the government's response, well, we have a Prime Minister who publicly yesterday contradicted the advice of his most senior public health official, we have politicians, I think quite childishly, refusing to wear masks, we have a health secretary who is choosing to pick fights with GPs rather than giving them the support that they need to do the vaccination program. It's almost like a pantomime, but it's not funny. It's really not funny. It is deeply, deeply upsetting. So I work now in general practice and I see, I see it every day, the pain and the um, suffering and the debilitating conditions people are living in because our health service is buckling. And, you know, the truth is we will never, we probably will never know the number of deaths that could have been prevented. But one of those deaths was one of my colleagues. He was a 50 year old GP who came to work in this country from Sri Lanka. And he died in the hospital that he had been working in. So I think we, we just cannot allow this carelessness to human life to continue. So I urge all of you today to really engage with this report. And I really urge the government to listen and to, to learn and to show some humility because everyone, everyone in our society deserves for their lives, deserves for their health and deserves for their dignity to be protected. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sonia Adesara. Now, the second part of this press conference today will uh, comprise a Q&A session. Uh, we have members of the press in the room and also online. Um, to the guests and supporters who have come today, uh, thank you very much. Your presence is really appreciated. Um, but as this is a press conference, we'll be taking questions primarily from members of the press. Um, some of them are online, so I'm taking my signals from the back of the room. Um, as, to, as to when there are likely to be questions. In the first instance, do we have any questions in the room? We have a roving uh, microphone. So if you do have any questions, please raise your hand. If not, do we have any online? Not at the moment. Okay, in that case, um, I'd like to thank everybody very much. Um, is there anything else that any of the panel members would like to say? We wait for any other questions.
Yes, of course. Thank you very much. As there is a few, few moments more, I would just like to add to the, the comments that my colleagues have made, which is to say that we, we do feel at the end of the people's COVID inquiry that there are, there are questions to be asked about the conduct of uh, the government during the pandemic, but there are also questions to be asked about the direction that we should take now. The mistakes that I articulated in respect to the NHS are continuing to this day. And if we do not address those, then we will be left as, as a country, as, a, as the public body, with um, a decimated health service. It is, I think, extremely important to recognize that the pandemic has underlined, underscored, emphasized, shown, uh, shown a spotlight on many of the problems that we that were, were being led up to prior to the pandemic. And this is an opportunity actually to turn this round and for us to say, yes, we do want a health service that is publicly provided, predominantly publicly developed, de delivered, and that is not one that is constantly undermined by the, uh, the, the predatory behavior of the private sector. So I would, I, I would, I would like to emphasize that this pandemic has been a wake-up call in so many respects. I'm speaking about the NHS, and I would like to emphasize the wake-up call in respect to the NHS, and the fact that the country stands at a crossroads now as to whether or not it wishes to go down a largely US model, or whether it wishes to retain the absolutely magnificent founding principles of the National Health Service. Dr. Jackie Davis. Thanks. If I could just add to that, actually, because one of the things that was really striking listening to people was how the pandemic did shine a light on the, the very dire situation in much wider society than the NHS. Um, and we had Sir Michael Marmot, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who gave evidence, and he talked about building back better. This is our opportunity to build back better. We need not put up with these terrible inequalities in society, which led to the shocking death rates and the disproportionate death rates amongst the vulnerable. I didn't address the uh, minority ethnic groups who died in terrible numbers and who worked um, on the front line in the NHS were dressing themselves in bin bags um, about the people in, in, in uh, you know, driving buses who died because they couldn't get protection. It's a chance to address society um, and, and to make it better after this terrible shock. And if we don't take that, it will be a dreadful reflection on, on those who govern us. Um, and I hope this report will go some way to really putting pressure on them to do that. Thank you. Could I also add that we mentioned that 60% um, of people that died were disabled people. And, um, the rate of death amongst the disabled community is just absolutely shocking. The rate of death amongst people with complex learning difficulties was even higher. Now, this was not because they were ill, it was because, I mean, they weren't at increased risk because of their particular condition. They were placed at increased risk by the government's abandonment of them and the neglect of the risks that they faced, and the heightening of that risk. So, at its most extreme, some disabled activists have called that form of, ge of genocide, but it's certainly absolute neglect. We in Key Parish as public are also demanding a complete re-overhaul of social care and care offered to people with disability for independent living. This country is one of the worst when it should be one of the best for the richness of its economy, one of the worst now the way it treats disabled people. So uh, Key Financial Public uh, is very pleased that this report, hearing from people like Michael Marmot and hearing from the evidence from the front line, hearing from disabled activists to whom we're very grateful for giving in-person testimony and video testimony. We are grateful to them and we are calling for a national care and independent living support service. Thank you, Dr. Tony. So, uh, there's a question uh, in the audience. Uh, do you have the microphone? Great. Uh, if you could um, announce who you are. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Kat Hobbs from We Own It. <clears throat> we campaign alongside the NHS public. Um, I 
mostly just want to say thank you for, for such a set of incredibly moving speeches. It's really, really powerful. Um, and I think the way that you've sort of borne witness to what's happened is, is really vital. And it's important that we take this time to pause and think about what's happened. And that's what you've done with this event and this report. So thank you. Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts on um, uh, campaigning really and how we move forward and how we how we reinstate our NHS as the fully public service properly funded that we need it to be. Um, I, I know you've talked a bit about the path ahead, but, but any other thoughts on, on how we can build, really build that better um, as, you, as you touched on? Thank you. Um, well, I could kick it off. <laughs> um, what I'm going to say is personal. It's not, I'm not pretending that we've discussed this. Uh, well, we have discussed it, but not in the terms that I just want to mention. Because what can, and the whole point of the people's inquiry, as I tried to point out, is that taking the initiative, citizens taking the initiative. And the problem with our system at the moment is it's not democratic. And there are very few people who would say that what we have is a democratic system. We have. Lord Hailsham of all people, uh, as some of you may remember, well anyway, because of my age I certainly remember, you would never have expected him of all people to indicate that his assessment of our system, and this is 25 years ago, it is that we're, what we're doing is providing a democratically elected dictatorship. That is exactly what we thought. So the answer to your question is a political one with a small p. And I'm very, in this arena and lots of other arenas, I think it's where citizens come together collectively and by example, show the way for other citizens. It's a bit like people come out on their doorsteps to support the NHS, but then the politicians give them a 1% pay rise. That's the difference. And so I think once a government realizes, particularly this one, when they wake up one morning and find that actually it's not such a popular move, so we'll change the policy. So in fact, where the public step into the breach, although they're exhausted, although they're fatigued, although we've heard these terrible stories of what's going, and we heard them in the inquiry, in the hospitals, and they're heartrending. The, the people, the staff are dying on the premises. You know, the prime minister's got to reckon staff are dying. And there's no use your your platitudes and so on about some public inquiry which you may or may not do. So I think it's my way forward is for citizens to come together as they have done from time to time, right back through history and the levelers and so on, they've come together, combined together, because waiting for the politicians will be here, and, you know, there'll be another pandemic before we get any kind of change. And I'm afraid at the moment, we do not have a healthy opposition because they are disempowered. And we have, the only opposition is coming from parts of the Conservative Party, which are doing it for very different reasons. And so, at the end of the day, it's back to us. We have to step in where we can. And this is the object of the people's inquiry. That's, that's the way I look at it. Namely, it's a collectivity of citizens that will make the difference at the end of the day. Thank you, uh, Professor Nina Modi. Thank you very much for, for that question. I'm going to come back to the NHS because you asked very specifically too about what actions should, be, we, should we be promoting and advocating for to go forward. And I will, I will give you five of them. But the first thing, as has been said again and again and again, is we do need a cross-party agreement on a long-term funding solution for the NHS. We had that way back at this, the start of this, this century, and then it, it, we, we, we lost it. We also need a very sensible long-term staffing plan. We cannot create doctors and nurses or indeed skilled laboratory staff overnight. But what we've had is a kind of knee-jerk reaction every time numbers go down, Somebody says, well, we're going to have a thousand more medical students or hundred more medical. That's, that's not going to work. We need a long-term solution to start with. We also need to stop the NHS being constantly undermined by a very rapidly growing private sector. And this is incredibly important. It's important because I would like people to know how a parallel private sector undermines a public health sector. It undermines it, first of all, by poaching staff. Because, of course, the NHS trains staff, and then those staff are lured away by short-term promises of better funding. And that means the NHS is constantly having to fight with inadequate staffing. 
it also undermines the NHS because the private sector cherry picks the easy cases. If you have a treatment a surgery in a private hospital and you fall seriously ill, you will be transferred to the NHS. The private sector will not accept you if you're complex, chronic, long-term. Long they will not hang on to you if things go wrong. Why in heavens, I would far rather start my journey within an NHS hospital than go to a private hospital and then be transferred out. So that's another example of undermining. The third um, example of undermining is that the private sector creates the worried well. You will all of you probably have been um, received uh, requests to sign up to a health screen or a health check or an MRI, MRI scan or a genetic test. All these things do is create a greater cadre of worried well who are then referred to the NHS to deal with the repercussions of these chance findings, which 99% of the time have no, no health uh, consequences whatsoever. And then finally, the private sector does not contribute to biomedical research. So each time you undermine the public health sector, you reduce the ability to research, to innovate, and to create new, new, new products. The second point I want to come back to is that, of course, the NHS has got, the acute health services have got to function in tandem with properly resourced public care, primary care, community care services. We don't see that at the moment. And also, of course, you've got to, um, you've got to recognize, you, 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 you've got to recognize this very, very strong sense of united purpose that exists within public sector staff. You will not find this where the driving force is money. But the driving force isn't money for everyone. And it certainly wasn't money for the NHS during the pandemic. Why are we not building on that sense of, of united public purpose and valuing it? We're not. Money does not drive everything. And finally, I would say that um, government has not recognised this enormous commitment that public sector staff, they have dismissed it, devalued it, failed to recognise it, and continue to behave as though money drives everything. It does not. So I give you those few examples of what we should be doing in terms of advocacy for the health service that serves all of us. I think we have a question online coming back to the press. Hello, can you hear me? I think you can. Um, we used to have uh, a patient's charter. I don't know if we still have one, and if we have, is it any use? Can we use it effectively in the current situation? I hope you've heard that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Judith. Um, Choosing to answer your question, I hope, I hope I'll have a go at it. I think um, the, the, the content of the patient's charter or indeed an NHS constitution uh, is, is perhaps useful to lay out what pa patients should have as rights. But the only meaningful uh, substance to that is if there are services provided to meet those rights, and if the government is, is, has, is held to account for the failing to provide the ability of the NHS or social care to meet the needs of, of, of patients and people who need their support. So um, for me, the answer to Kat's earlier question is that we need a strong campaign of unity, uh, uniting campaigners, uniting patients, okay, uniting trade unions who have a particular uh, responsibility to support their members, but they also have huge political power if they, if they choose to use that. And the, the politicians who have their interests too often uh, for looking at the, their next election rather than the future of society. So I think I've gone off your point a little bit, I'm sorry, but patients' charters are, are, are useful, are, are good, 
but the only way to, to hold them hold the government to account is a strong campaign in the united movement and that should go across civil society um, and at the moment the campaigners know what is needed but we don't have the resources and the unity across the police so we are arguing now for a a, an, an emergency campaign in defence of the NHS and indeed of social care this winter now with, with key branches public health campaigns together we own it and other organisations and trade unions to come out fighting to support what would be the content of the patient's charter. Thank you, uh, Dr Jackie Davis. Thanks, I just want to draw attention to something that's in the report actually which uh, we heard from, um, from uh, occupational health doctors that workers have a right to be protected on the front line. There are laws around that, and perhaps uh, Michael can address them more, but it's very important that they should have been protected and they simply weren't. And they died in shocking numbers. Not only did they die, but they got long COVID, which had very serious consequences for people. Um, you know, the GMB, for instance, the GMB union is already calling for justice the families of workers who died and for the workers who went on to get long COVID. Now, some of that could be, uh, we heard from a lawyer at the end of the um, inquiry, could be pursued through the courts and there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Sometimes you think the only way this government will wake up to re the responsibility that they have and the accountability they need to take is actually being challenged in a court of law. And I wonder if Michael would like to take that. Yes, yeah, certainly, thank you. Um, it really flows from what I was saying a bit earlier, because uh, I didn't develop it at that point, but it does need, it, first of all, it requires a commitment from those of us who recognize, as has been spelled out very uh, clearly by Nina and, and Jackie, the, the principle, we all know what the principles are that we want to follow. And they, they were, they've been enunciated very clearly in the evidence and in the report about the necessity for certain aspects, certain measures, certain protections for everybody, for all. The problem, uh, of course, I still see it as a political one because you're not going to pers persuade the present government or, or for that matter, any successive government of these particular commitments because we're in this pickle now, this disastrous, catastrophic pickle because politicians have not stepped up uh, and uh, as it were, supported the NHS in the way that they should have done. So it's really, we're on the front line, all of us now. So the question that you're posing is, of course, uh, I think that this government and any successful one has to be challenged at every twist and turn by you know, campaigns and members of the public that are committed that know what is just and fair that should be pursued within the NHS, not just the principles, but the actual practical measures that are going to make a difference for staff and for the public and for the public health. But of course, the problem with using that, that there are protections within the law, no doubt the bereaved want the judicial public inquiry, which will have powers. But the problem is, as I've said already, we don't have any details of that as to when it's going to start. And even when it does get started, um, most inquiries, although they can bring people to account in the sense they come to give evidence, they don't normally attribute liability or come to conclusions about liability as such. But there is an element of truth seeking, there's an element of accountability. So the other way of approaching it is, of course, you know, suing in the courts. But the problem there, and if you like, I'm a public service lawyer, so I certainly know this, that it's suffered just as the NHS has. And in terms of public funding, it's been cut dramatically. 40%. So unless you've got the means to pursue, and unions sometimes have, but even they are bereft as well. It, it, whereas there might be rights that be, which have been breached in terms of the workplace, and, and certainly in the health respect, that's certainly so. But you've got to have the resources, the means, and also the patience to pursue it. I'm not saying don't do it, I'm just saying th these are the difficulties that they have. So you do need uh, pressure points on a number of fronts, the campaigning front, the legal front, the, if you like, advocacy and public front. All these things have to be happening together, which requires this collectivity that I talked about uh, between various groups that understand the needs. But yes, there are, there are legal avenues, but the problem is, as I say, the financial hurdle of actually mounting them and then getting the result because they'll undoubtedly 
you know, be be challenged. But that does, that shouldn't. And that's why we're and certainly Mona and I, my very lawyers, is we don't give up making the challenge because that's our bit. That's the role we've got to play is to ensure that this government is challenged where it should be in relation to these matters, even though it's pro, uh, prolonged and, and even though it may cost money to do so. It's essential that the statements are made. So I think nobody should ever ever give up, but, but basically it's a united challenge coming in a variety of ways. And then as it were, I, I, this is my view of politics, is that you're not going to change anything in the House of Commons. It's got to come from the streets. Mm -hmm. People have got to put pressure so that in the end, those who do have a responsibility, legally speaking, to pass laws and create funds and create a satisfactory public health system are driven because there's not much else they can do if they're going to stay in the power that they so uh, willingly hang on to. So that, that's, that's an approach that I have. Uh, this question online. Uh, thank you, uh, Colin Hutchinson from Doctors for the NHS. Um, on behalf of Hugh Pym from BBC, and he says, apart from locking down earlier, what did Italy, Spain and France do better than the UK in terms of preparation and response to the pandemic? Um, Italy was the front line of this pandemic in Europe, certainly, and our huge sympathies to the Italian people. They bore the brunt of the emergence of the pandemic beyond um, Southeast Asia, and it was a wake-up call for the West. Um, and it was shocking what, what happened there. They were overwhelmed. One of the things that they and other countries have done is actually invest in a stronger health service. So they have, for example, um, more than double the number of intensive care beds than in the UK. Germany had nearly six times as many intensive care beds in the UK, um, three times as many hospital beds 50% more doctors. The, if we were funded at the level of funding for Germany, we would probably have had 20 to 30 billion pounds a year invested in the NHS over the last 10 years, every year. France um, has a, a stronger funding for the health service than England and Britain. So, Virtually all the comparative, the comparative economies in, in Europe have a stronger investment in, in pay, uh, pounds per head of the population, per capita spending. So Italy was blown away by the tragedy of the pandemic hitting their, their shores uh, ahead of the whole world, and they suffered in, intensely. Um, I think they were caught really off guard when we had their warning ahead of time and we failed to respond to it. The, the arrogance that it wasn't going to hit us too is just astonishing, let alone the, ign the ignoring of what was going on in, in China. Um, so Italy has suffered very, very badly. Uh, I would still say that they had respected their health service far more than the government in this country for the last 12 years. The rest of the European uh, stronger economies have invested in public services better than the UK. And, uh, up till 2009, we were the best health service in a major country in the world, demonstrably so. And the government has seen a steady decline in our, in our services and capacity to respond. The, the learning from places like Italy, Germany, France is to respect the importance of public health, to respect the level of resource in the health service so that you have some resilience to cope with emergencies. 
and although they've had tragic losses in those countries too, um, Italy is one of the worst. We, we have respect for the efforts that they've made. We've done worse than, than ever. Thank you, Tony. Um, I've got Michael next, then Nina, then Sonia. Yes, I'm happy to defer. Um, I just, I, I, I would, a word of caution, if, if I may. Uh, it's an interesting question, but the, I think one of the problems that's faced the public discussion has been, and I'm afraid, again, it comes from politicians mainly, is this nationalism and competitiveness. We are going to be first in the queue. Sorry. That's not, in other words, it's very easy to look over the border and say, well, they're doing that. you know, this isn't about a comparison of deaths. It's about looking at the origins here. And I am re remembering the phrase, I, I don't know who coined it to begin with. If it's anywhere, it's everywhere. In other words, it's a global problem, not just a domestic one. It obviously is domestic. And one of the points made by the two leaders of the task force that have been speaking recently is that this needs, and this is why the South African uh, Minister for Health got so angry the other day in an interview, is because there's this nationalism in which Countries that can afford it have, are into their booster and talking about a fourth booster when two thirds of the world haven't had the first one yet. There's no point in us, as it were, I don't think anyway. This, you know, perfidious Albion's putting up the, the barriers almost. I mean, I know there are all sorts of barriers that are necessary, but it's about an isolationism that actually the select committee, what they should have said is it's isolationism that is part of the problem here. And, and I think that the development internationally of vaccines, not just for this strain, there's going to be another one coming down the track. And until globally there's, inter, you know, there's cooperation, whatever the government is, cooperation on an international level to ensure there's an equaling up for us or everybody in terms of access to the vaccine. Because unless you do that, we're whistling in the wind. Sorry, that's just a, that's not the idea. Professor Lady. Thank you very much. I'd just like to add briefly to Hugh, Hugh's question, and that is consistency of the public health response. Um, we have not we have had mixed messages emanating um, uh, since the start of the pandemic in respect of wearing masks, gout, social gatherings, and and so on. So my 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 additional comments um, following on from comments from from Michael and from Tony to, to Hugh, are we have not had a consistent public health response led by example from the top, which is what they have had in many other countries. Um, Dr. Sonia Abisar. Yeah, I just agree with the point that you made. It isn't just a failure of our government, but this is the biggest global health failure. Um, I also remember speaking to a friend of mine who works for um, one of the big vaccine producers and he was this was a few weeks or a couple of months ago and he goes you were very close mathematically to having a variant that would be able to bypass the vaccine because the virus is proliferating at such fast rates in, in many countries you know low-income countries 94 percent of the population remains unvaccinated um, but back to the initial question about why we've done so badly in this country i think something that we really, we maybe haven't emphasized enough is the health of our population in this country. You know, so we are called the sick man of Europe. Um, and that's because of the large levels of health inequality that we have in this country, shockingly high levels of health inequality. So when we talk about health inequality, um, we're talking about the in quite stark terms, the difference in life expectancy between those living in the poorest and the most deprived areas and the richest areas of the country, but also the, you know, that's about often about 10 years in many parts of the country, but the, the healthy living expectancy. So that's the age in which um, you start to get health conditions. We're looking at 15 to 20 years difference between those living in wealthy parts to those living in more deprived parts. So that means we have large numbers of people, particularly those in deprived areas of the country who, are, who have health conditions at an increasingly younger age. And of course, that puts them to, at more risk, as we know, to dying, not just from COVID, but from other viruses as well. Um, 
So this is a failure, not, you know, actually not of this government, of successive governments, and going forward, that's something we need, really need to address because it is just unacceptable. Thank you, Dr. Jack Davis. Um, thank you. To go back to that original question from, from Hugh Pym, um, I, first of all, I don't think we should downplay the effects of that late lockdown. And we heard from a number of um, epidemiologists, public health experts, that, that thousands of lives could have been saved if the government had, had locked down when they were told to or when they were advised to, because guess what? You know, advisors advise and ministers decide. So ministers made very poor decisions. Look at the Cheltenham Race Festival. You know, shocking, absolutely shocking. So, so the effect of the late lockdown was a very serious one, but I just wanted to talk about attitude at the beginning of this pandemic. The attitude of the government was very less effect. Boris Johnson did not turn up to the first five COBRA meetings. We've already heard about deadlines and books on Shakespeare. You know, that's absolutely shocking. He talked about Operation Last Gasp. It was a joke. You know, that, that really was upsetting for people who were dying because they couldn't breathe. Leadership comes from the top. And the leadership was not shown from the top, and that percolates down to the bottom. And we've seen it reflected, wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. I came here by tea this morning. It's now a political statement. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a quote in here. We haven't even talked about the effect of the pandemic on women, which was completely shocking. You know, they were in the front line of all of this. Um, and it, again, exacerbated those inequalities. And somebody who raised this, um, about women's position said, we're not Liberia here. Guess what? You know, this pandemic has reduced us all to the same level um, at that stage it had. And the attitude of this government was absolutely cavalier and shocking. And I think that's really contributed to, to, to the disaster we found ourselves in. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Davis. Uh, we have one more question online, then I think we're going to have to wrap up. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to give my congratulations, uh, Colin Hutchinson from Doctors for the NHS. I'd like to congratulate the, uh, uh, the People's Inquiry for gathering so much valuable evidence while it is still clear in people's memories before those memories become dulled and um, contaminated, if you like. All the way through, we've had a government that has sought magic bullets, a single solution to a complex problem. And our policies are so heavily dependent on vaccination, which has been a wonderful um, uh, public health measure, but there's a significant proportion of the population who have underlying health disease conditions or on medication, that means that they can't mount a, a, a good immune response despite vaccination. And they, this means that they're going to be at long-term risk of serious infection. What rights do these people actually enjoy under this government or are they condemned to years of shielding. Thank you, Colin. Um, these, your, your question really is a statement uh, in reverse that they, they, their rights have been abandoned. Um, the response medically should have been to have strong public health protection for the whole population, both nationally and internationally, and to have the vaccine uh, developed as soon as possible as it was alongside public health measures and never to abandon those public health measures. And that would have been protecting all, all the population, including those that are are unable or can't accept the need for taking the vaccination. Um, so those are the medical reasons. There are, there are political reasons that uh, have left vulnerable, vulnerable people to be vulnerable, that have placed people that weren't at risk into higher level of risk. That's a, a, an issue 
uh, we're grateful for the press coverage of our report so far. Um, a, a lot of press have already covered our report to the Today programme, GMB, Daily Mail, Independent, Byline Times, Wales Online, Morning Star, Huffington Post, Bloomberg Radio. But so I'm hoping that these, this coverage will actually get the message out to uh, it's not too late to protect those in the population that remain at risk. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid we don't have any more time for any more questions, but I'd like to thank everyone on behalf of the organisers Keep Our NHS Public panel uh, for coming today and for the members of the press who are here in uh, virtually uh, online. Um, just just in, in closing remarks, really, I just want to say that this pandemic has genuinely exacerbated existing inequalities and really shone a light on those existing inequalities and widened them. And while this is a global issue, it's not, it's not too late to learn lessons. And this is a snapshot. This, this report is a snapshot of what has happened and how we responded. And it's shameful. But what we can take pride in, in my view, is that having asked the questions um, in most of the sessions, there was just the pride of people who selflessly put themselves on the front line day after day, helping others in need. And the, the definition of a key worker is very different from that which we might have thought back in March 2020. These are ordinary people who help make up the fabric of our, our society. They deserve compassion. They deserve dignity. It's completely absent from our leadership, but that doesn't mean that uh, it, it shouldn't be part of our society. That's what we have to continue to do. And I think it's interesting that the word of the year for Cambridge Dictionary is perseverance, because we will persevere, and this is not the end. Um, and I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming today and that the long report is available online at peoplescovidinquiry.com. Thank you very much.